Okay, excellent. So then let's start. Oh, welcome everyone. My name is Matthias Markowski. Just, just leave it there. Um, I think we have all met yesterday at this introductory section. So I'm a scientific co-worker at the Otto von Gericke University in Magdeburg in Germany. Uh, I work there at some institute for medical engineering, even if I do not have too much to do with medical engineering. But I work for a chair for electromagnetic compatibility, and this will also be the topic for today, electromagnetic compatibility measurements um, in reverberation chambers. So before we start, some words about me, about myself. I'm, as you can see, almost 40 years old. I have two children. I'm happily married. Uh, I also studied electric engineering quite a time ago, um, 20 years ago, maybe at the time when you were born. <laughs> Yes, uh, I, uh, since 15 years, I work as a scientific co-worker and lecturer at the University in Magdeburg. I also did my PhD there. And uh, yeah, since a couple of years, I'm also working as a flying faculty lecturer, uh, also giving courses at other universities like here. I've been to Russia uh, several times, but this obviously does not work anymore for known reasons, so I'm happy to be here uh, in Angers. I've been here before in 2017, if I remember correctly, and this year we also visited Paris. So it's a picture of my family. Uh, my, my kids, uh, Mona and Moritz, they are now, of course, a little older, and my, my son is already taller than me, uh, so time flies by. So this is the building in Magdeburg where I work and where some of our laboratories are. And this is another city of a uh, picture of the city of Magdeburg. So if you like Angers, you would also probably like Magdeburg. Uh, cities are quite comparable. Uh, we have about 200,000 inhabitants. I think Angers has a little less, slightly less. But we also have a river, it's called Elbe. We also have lots of churches and a big cathedral. And um, we, are, we are also kind of a green city. So if you like to go to parks or if you like to go swimming or uh, running and cycling, um, then Magdeburg is also a very nice city for this, like, like, like Angers is, I think. I've been yesterday and the day before to this uh, Lake Saint-Nicolas which is very, very beautiful, I think. Um, and yeah, so nature site is very close to the city. Okay, so, and if you don't know where Magdeburg is located or situated, it is somewhere in this triangle between Dresden, uh, Berlin, most people know for sure, and Hannover, uh, like Angers is in this triangle between, let's say, Paris, Nantes, and I, I don't know. <laughs> So, so somewhere there. <laughs> okay, so then some organizational matters. Uh, if you want to have the slides of this presentation, you can. I have not uploaded them yet, but if you send me a message or an email, um, I will be happy to share them with you. I will also try recording, uh, as you can see. So maybe there's a recording available later on. And if you have questions in between, feel free to ask these questions in between. Don't wait until the end, uh, until you have probably forgotten about the question. Okay, so then the topic um, as mentioned for today is what is electromagnetic compatibility? So we will briefly discuss this. We will take a look at some examples. Um, then what is, from my point of view, quite important uh, if you think about such problems is that you know how to do calculations in decibels, or at least know what this means. Uh, so we will take a look at this, at what figures and levels are. Then we will have a brief look on radiated uh, electromagnetic compatibility measurements. And then this is really my specialty from research, and we will have a very, very brief look into this. What, what is the reverberation chamber? What does it mean? Okay, so um, let's start with some small quiz and some small survey uh, that I've prepared. So please take your uh, cell phones and um, go to this Menti webpage.
Is the projector that bad or is the <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look at the results. Does it does it work? Does it work? No, you, you usually should not need to create an account. Well, I I would I would I would try to check it myself. Okay, so on, on, on my thing it works. I would say I know really a lot and of course I'm also very interested in this topic and submit. Okay, and then it says thanks for your participation. Okay, so um, some 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 uh, most of you say you don't have heard that much about this topic and at least you are a little interested. <laughs> okay, so let, let's come back to this question what, uh, what EMC is and what does it mean. So we are all losing, using lots of electric electronic devices all the time. So if you would disable all the fuses in your home, if you take out all the batteries of all the equipment, then what will not work then anymore is what works with help of electrical energy and electric signals and so on. And um, we expect that all these devices nicely work together and that there's no interference and that there's no malfunction, even if these devices are somehow coupled with each other via cables and via electromagnetic fields and so on. And every cable that you have somewhere always acts as an antenna and will radiate signals and will receive signals. So, um, this nice coexistence of electric devices, this is what electromagnetic compatibility means. So there's a brief definition about this. Yeah? It's the ability of some electric electronic equipment to work satisfactorily into a certain environment. So it means it should be immune to external fields and don't show any malfunction. And at the same time, it should not introduce unwanted signals into the same environment that could disturb other devices. And this is emission or radiation. So there are these two aspects in there. Um, devices should be immune to external fields and at the same time they should not emit into that environment. Okay, so we can put this into a quite simple model and say there are sources of disturbances and there are potential victims of disturbances and there's a coupling path in between. And a simple example would be you have your Wi-Fi router at home. This creates some electromagnetic waves and they could interfere with your TV set or with some display or something like this. And so today it's working quite nice, but uh, the day before the, the projector had some problems that pictures sometimes got black or that there were some glitches in the image, uh, which could be some kind of interference. Okay. And this, the, 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 the coupling path here in between, so this can happen via cables, then we would say it's galvanic coupling or um, conductive coupling. 
Um, it can happen via electric fields, then we would say it's capacitive coupling. It can happen via magnetic fields. Then we would say it's inductive coupling and it can happen um, at higher frequencies via wave fields, electromagnetic fields, because at higher frequencies, the electric field and the magnetic field, they cannot be separated uh, from each other anymore. There, there's a nice presentation of a German colleague of mine uh, which is called um, ENH, uh, the electric field and the magnetic field, they are instant best friends forever. You cannot have an electric field without a magnetic field and vice versa at high frequencies. Okay, and then these fields are created by antennas. Okay, so after this brief definition, uh, let's have a look at some examples. And for this, I've, uh, I would like to show a small experiment. So I will shortly stop my presentation and uh, we'll go over here. So, oh, and projector turns black, but that, that's back again. So for the experiment, I need my, um, as you can see, I have, a, I have a modern cell phone, but I also have an old cell phone. And my kids always say, um, well, do it like this. And they say, your, your cell phone isn't working. And I say, yeah, it's not a touch screen. <laughs> you, you have to use the buttons. So um, with this cell phone and this speakers here, uh, we can do a nice demonstration of what electromagnetic incompatibility means. So uh, I will call someone and um, this cell phone is still on a running on a prepaid account and as a poor lecturer I don't have much money on my card and I don't want to lose money so I will call someone that will not answer the phone. I will call my office in Magdeburg. So if I call and hold this close to the speakers then you hear some nice interference. And it, it gets smaller with greater distance and uh, but it can be very strong here close to this and it's also where's this cable oh. here's the here's the signal cable where you would usually attach this to your computer and it's also quite sensitive along this cable and if i quit the call then it's gone Oh, but if I if I would, would open up the call again, uh, then you hear this nice nice interference. Have you heard this before? Do you know this effect? Some some, some know it. Not not really. Okay. So uh, th this is clearly some electromagnetic incompatibility. So the, the, the speaker reacts to the electromagnetic waves created by the cell phone. Um, and here the problem is obviously not very severe. Uh, so sometimes you, you, you hear that you will get a call in a second because your cell phone already answers the call and creates some electromagnetic waves. But um, Imagine you are somewhere in a hospital and you are connected uh, to some device that measures your heartbeat and you are also playing there around with your cell phone and this will create electromagnetic waves and the same interference and then uh, the device measuring your heartbeat will not measure 60 beats per minute but will measure something like uh, 200 beats per minute because it also takes a beep, 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 beep. Yeah, and so then uh, Two, two or three doctors will soon be around you and trying to put you back into life because they think that you you are just going to die. So this is this is obviously not good. So let's go back to my presentation and share the screen again. So the next idea for you is I have prepared a short survey. Um, if you know from your daily life other examples of such incompatibility, maybe from 
your home from, I don't know, from a laboratory, from school, from university, from classes, um, something like this. Okay, so let's have a look at the results. Or some some of you are still typing. Okay, so we have, so let's take a look. And there are um, some still some results in there from the groups before you. Answers. Sorry. So. Um, <laughs> When I put my, f <laughs> yeah, this is certainly not some electromagnetic incompatibility, but some other incompatibility. Um, this is this is some interesting effect. I, I I cannot say anything about this because I'm I'm not a doctor. I'm just an engineer. Um, saturated, yeah, that you that you'd somehow lose bandwidth or lose data could be some effect um, that your Wi-Fi router creates problems. I don't know if Paul, <laughs> if Paul also creates some electromagnetic incompatibility. Okay, so, so I've, I've said yesterday uh, that these health problems or health effects um, are really kind of interesting. So, as I said, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor. I, I cannot really say something about this, but th there are interesting effects because um, people, humans, don't have any senses for electromagnetic waves. So we, we cannot feel ele electromagnetic waves. There are for sure um, heating effects. So if you go into a strong electromagnetic field, like if you would put yourself into a large microwave oven, you would heat up because there are thermal effects. Um, like when you put food in a microwave oven. Still, if the field is very small, the heating will be, will be very, also there will be just very few rise of temperature. And we have no senses of um, feeling if there's some electromagnetic field or not. Um, and if you, if you do blind tests with, with people, um, so you radiate on them with some antenna or not, and then you ask them, is there some radiation or not? They, they cannot know. So in blind tests, it's, the, it's just if they would guess. So no, no one can feel or no one was able in some, in some blind tests to feel if there's a, an electric field or not. But some people say, if there is some electric field, I get a headache or I feel some pain or something like this. And so then you can do experiments with such people, put them, for example, in some MRI machine, in some MRI scanner. And, um, and give them some arm wrist that really causes pain yeah, because it's heating up the skin so that people really feel pain. And you can, with the MRI machine, look in their brain how, how pain looks like in the brain. So you, you cause pain, real, real, real pain, and you look how pain looks like in the brain. And okay. And then you take the same people and say, without the, without the pain arm risk, you say, now we radiate onto you with electromagnetic fields, or there will be electromagnetic fields around. There will be electrosmog, something like this. And then the people feel the same pain in their head as if you would cause them real pain by such a pain armrest. So it's an, it's an interesting effect. 
uh, so people cannot feel electromagnetic fields, but if they are afraid of electromagnetic fields and if they say this causes some headache or pain, then it's like real pain in their body, even if there is no real cause for this pain. So this is some, some quite interesting effect from my point of view. Okay, where's my mouse here? Um, so let's, let's go back to the slides. And I have some, some other examples there um, for yeah, electromagnetic effects, electromagnetic incompatibilities. So one, one EMC issue is also lightning. If there is bad weather outside and a thunderstorm, um, then the air particles and water molecules inside the cloud, they, there's friction and there's tribal electricity and charges get separated. So um, clouds might get charged up against a different cloud or against the ground. And if the charge is too high and the potential difference is too high, then there will be a discharge or there can be a discharge. Um, that we see as a lightning between two clouds or lightning from cloud to ground. And if the lightning hits an overhead line, then there will be a large current, large voltage, and it will be, might be dangerous for devices connected uh, to this overhead line. So what, what you can then use at your home is such over voltage protection to protect sensitive equipment. Um, if you are outside in a thunderstorm, you should take cover, put your feet close together, because if the lightning strike hits the ground, current will go into the ground. The ground is like a resistor, it's a lossy ground. So if you have a current flowing over the resistor, there will be a voltage drop. And if you have your feet in, in a certain distance, then your, your both, both of your feet will see a different potential. So current will also flow over your body and you might drop that. Uh, so if you're outside in a thunderstorm, <laughs> keep your feet close together. Safest thing is if you go into a car vehicle uh, because the electric, uh, the, the metallic enclosure acts as a Faraday cage. So you are somehow safe. Um, same as if you're on an aircraft, yeah, so this is a picture of some aircraft where the lightning hits the aircraft at the front, exits at the rear. So passengers inside this aircraft, they are kind of safe. Um, but the, um, it might be dangerous for, the, for, for some sensitive electronic equipment inside the aircraft because the current going over the fuselage of the aircraft creates some magnetic field. Um, and the magnetic field, if it changes over time, then can induce voltages and currents inside cables and so on in the aircraft. So the same thing, but a little smaller is electrostatic discharge. You walk on a carpet or on the floor, you also get charged up. And if you touch some metallic part somewhere that is somehow grounded, there's a small discharge. Um, it's not dangerous for you, it's not dangerous for the doorknob, but it's dangerous if you discharge yourself into sensitive electronic equipment. If I would discharge into the USB cable of the computer, for example, then it might be dangerous for the uh, sensitive components uh, inside the computer. There's usually some protection there, but if you handle and deal with sensitive electronic equipment, you should wear such a, a conductive wrist strap that dissipates the charge all the time over some large um, one mega ohm or 10 mega ohm resistor built inside there. If um, equipment, sensitive equipment is packed, you use these um, packages. I think I also have something here in my in my experimental suitcase, yeah, they, they can, can also look like, um, look like this. And there are some few metallization in there that would dissipate these charges. Um, and if you, if you would like to test devices for ESD, um, of course, no human has to walk on the carpet all the day and then like, discharge all the time. 
their so-called ESD guns, which a little bit look like a gun, and they get charged up and then you can discharge, uh, put, put certain discharges with this ESD gun into devices to check if they are immune against this. Okay, then I have some examples from the military world in, uh, because they are quite well documented. In the Korean War, the US had some aircraft carrier, USS Forrestal, uh, before North Vietnam, and this was fully loaded with fighter aircrafts on the deck. And then by accident, uh, one of these fighter aircrafts launched a rocket, rocket hit the next aircraft, this aircraft exploded and the fuel started to burn and there was a devastating fire and lots of people have been uh, killed and injured as you can see. And the reason for this was some um, electromagnetic issues, some electromagnetic incompatibility um, as later was found out. So there are two options for this, for the cause of this problem. Um, first is that the very powerful search radar of this ship hit the aircraft and that the cable um, that is used to connect the rocket uh, was not properly connected or the shield of this cable was not properly connected. So that there was some over voltage at this cable and this launched the rocket and the other option is that there was an over voltage when the pilot switched from external to internal power supply. But some, some smite, quite small um, electromagnetic incompatibility issue caused this um, very um, severe incident, as you can see. This is another example from Germany. This is some tornado fighter aircraft. And in the 1980s, there was a big radio transmitter station that would send radio for Europe into the East Bloc states, as you can see, with very high power, 150 kilowatts. And um, one of these fighter aircrafts was flying in very low altitude directly through the main beam of this radio transmitter station and the radio waves interfered with the control system of the aircraft and then the aircraft did like this and, and hit the ground and uh, control system failed, emergency system failed, ejection seats failed, um, aircraft lost and both pilots dead. Again, bad EMC design of this aircraft and um, yeah, the, the, the bad training of the pilots, the pilots were also just not aware of that it's not a good idea to take your fighter aircraft and fly directly in low altitude in front of a radio transmitter station because radio uh, waves then can interfere with the aircraft. And then the example is I have shown you my old cell phone, my speakers that I brought from my uh, office in Magdeburg. And what happens there is that you cannot really hear the high frequency of the um, cell phone. So does anyone know at which frequency the cell phone operates? What, what, is, what is the frequency that that the, the cell phone uses for, for radiation. You're, you're using it every day, but no, no one knows. So this is a 2G cell phone, uh, GSM system. Um, so it uses, there are two frequency bands. This one uses, or I've set it to use 900 megahertz and there's another frequency band at around uh, 1.8 gigahertz. And this is where we can also maybe do some um, small experiment in a, in a second. Yeah, so you, you do not hear the um, 900 megahertz of the cell phone for sure, but in this old GSM system, um, there are 125 frequency channels and each of these channels is used by eight cell phones or can be used by eight cell phones and they just send an eighth part of the time. So they switch on the signal and switch off and switch on the signal and switch off and switch on and off. So it's kind of amplitude modulated or it's, it's pulse modulated. And this signal is transmitted by the internal antenna and then will be picked up, for example, by the cable of these active speakers as every cable, as I've said, um, always acts as an antenna. And then the speaker is some active speaker 
So there are diodes in there and transistors and they will demodulate the signal. So what you hear is not the 800, 900 megahertz from the cell phone, but the shape how the cell phone switches the signal on and off. And this is what you hear, this beep, 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 and so on. So um, what you could do against this radiation is, of course, we cannot shield the cell phone. Uh, we could not shield the speakers. Uh, what, what we could do is we could shield the cable here, but then the cable would be much more expensive. And so what people then usually do is they, they put such ferrites around the cable. So um, if you see these knobs on cables, or I have also, this is the cable that I use later on to connect some other equipment, some USB cable, and the, the things here, these are ferrites. So if the electromagnetic field um, hits this cable, there will be some current induced on the cable. Current is in, uh, associated with some magnetic field around the cable. And the magnetic field will go into this ferrite and the ferrite is somehow lossy. So it will, um, it will kill the magnetic field and therefore also kill the current. And this only works at high frequencies. So the useful low frequency USB or audio signals, they will get through, but the high frequencies um, are, are killed by this. So, okay, then what we can maybe do is another small um, experiment and I will stop sharing my screen and shortly show my, my equipment. Um, so, hey, projector. That's back again. So what I have here on the table, this black thing is a software-defined radio. And this is not very expensive. You can buy them for about 50 euros on the internet. Um, and connected to this is some monopole antenna. And with this antenna, um, I can pick up electromagnetic fields. And with the software-defined radio, they will be somehow demodulated and via USB fed into the computer so I can analyze them. And the company of this device is written here. It, oh, now my, now my picture's gone. Technology is clearly against me today. Okay, there it is. So, uh, no elect, if you, if you search for this, um, you will find shops where you can buy this instrument. So now I need the proper software and it's called Cubic SDR. And share my screen again. So there the software is loading. It's scanning all the USB devices on my computer. Okay, and there it also found this generic software defined radio and I can start it and it seems to work. And I know that it works better if for some reason <laughs> I stop it and start it again. Don't ask me why. Okay, and that's already measuring something. And at first, I would like to go to the smaller frequency range here. Um, we are now at 88 megahertz. So around 80, 90 megahertz, 100 megahertz. What, what would you expect there? Yeah, so I, I would say at least in Germany and we can check. So there, there's obviously, so the, the um, blue stuff here, this is all noise. And this seems to be some, some useful signal. So. Uh, du Ministère de l'Éducation Nationale, 
Donc voilà, ce qui nous permet d'avoir quand même un, un certain, une certaine notoriété à aller parler d'Europe auprès des jeunes et des moins jeunes également. Donc pour cela, on a diversifié nos, nos outils. Donc, je ne parle pas français, donc je ne comprends pas ce qu'ils disent. Il y a beaucoup d'outils que l'on peut retrouver sur notre site internet, l'Europe par les jeunes. Ça sonne comme une radio, donc nous pouvons changer les interventions. So if in the in this band here, um, if there are other other useful stations, so there might be some some station here. Okay. So now if we go to this range, as I've said, around 900 megahertz. So as you can see, there's also something going on there. Um, this might be other cell phones, but now we have more or less just noise. Okay, and, and there are also already other different cell phones if I uh, once again operate and let me make this okay, super loud. If I operate my cell phone, Uh, there's once again radiation from my cell phone happening at this frequency and if I quit the call then once again it's gone. Uh, so this one at least operates now has selected a channel at 891 something something megahertz. Okay so then let's continue with this okay cameras checking again so let's continue with this calculation in decibel and once again i've created a short survey how large is your experience with using decibels So now I will directly go to the corresponding web page, which should be somewhere here. Okay, and this is also mixed with the results of the previous groups. So some people say excellent, most people say good, some say okay. Uh, no one says no experience at all, and some have just very few experience. Okay, so yesterday I made the mistake. <laughs> no, I'm no, no mistake. So yesterday, uh, most people also said it's okay. Then I skipped the section, and at the end we had a quiz, and we found out okay, no one has such. Uh, everyone answered the question wrong. <laughs> so today I decided okay, anyhow I will say something about DB. So. Motivation is if you do measurements in high frequency engineering and radio frequency engineering and EMC, e most measurement devices will give you some results in dB. So this is some picture of a spectrum analyzer. Um, once again, if I would switch to my software here from the software defined radio, then this axis here, even if the letters are very small, there would be also something in dB. So if you deal with such measurements, you need to know about the dB scale. 
So DB is some logarithmic scale. So we need to know some mathematical rules about the logarithm. So just a short reminder of some logarithmic identities. If you have the logarithm of a product, it's the same as the sum of the logarithms, like, like, in, like in this one here. Uh, so then if you have the logarithm of a ratio, it's the same as the difference of the two logarithms. Like if you have um, a pizza or some meal or a, a cake or pie and divided by the members of the family, it would, would be the same calculation like this one here. And then most important for what we do now is if you have the logarithm of some exponential function, the exponent can be placed in front of the logarithm um, like, like in this equation here. Yeah, so this is, this is what we need to remember. Okay, and then there are two things in decibel that we can do. The first one is a figure. And these figures can be used to express, for example, gain or attenuation. So the idea is you have a two-port system, like an amplifier, for example, which has some input and some output. So we, we, the decibel is always defined for powers. So let's say we have a power at the input, we have a power at the output of some system. And if we take the ratio of these two powers, take the decadic logarithm out of it. And there's a question. No, 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 no. It's, 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 it, uh, yeah, exactly. So. I said, it's always defined for powers. We take the ratio of the powers. Units will nicely cancel each other. So the remaining thing is a number because you can only calculate the logarithm out of a number. You cannot calculate the logarithm out of a unit. Then we take the decadic logarithm and then we would get bell. And bell is not very handy. We want to have decibel. So we multiply with 10. The 10 here is because of the deci. And this is how it works for powers. And sometimes you have so-called root power quantities like a voltage or currents or something else. And the power is proportional to the square of the voltage divided by the resistance. So we could cancel the resistance and then put this exponent of two in front of the logarithm. And that's why then the 10 turns into a 20. Okay. so. This is a figure. Don't confuse this with this figure, for example. This is a figure of Otto von Guericke in Magdeburg. Uh, this is the, the name patron of our university. And he was also a mayor of our city. And he was also a researcher and a scientist. And for example, he did lots of experiments with vacuum. And you can see here. This is a famous kind of famous experiments that he, that he did. Have you heard about um, the Magdeburg hemispheres? So he took, he took two, uh, two really, really large hemispheres about this, maybe, maybe this diameter, put them together just with some seal. So they were not screwed together. They were just put together with some seal. And he, he, he also invented the air pump. So he invented the air pump and sucked the air out of it. So there was just vacuum between these spheres. And these spheres were just pushed together by the force of the external air, by the air pressure outside. And then they made a nice experiment, um, quite, quite costly, we would say today, with eight horses on one side and eight horses on the other side. And these 16 horses were not able to pull these hemispheres apart as a nice demonstration of the force of the external air pressure. And then the legend says that a small child came and opened up the valve and air flew in into the hemispheres and then they just fell apart. Um, so very nice demonstration. And he, he, he also find out, found out that in the, inside this vacuum, um, still light could be propagated. So if you have something where there's vacuum in there, you shine light in on the one side, uh, you will receive light on the other side because light is also some electromagnetic wave and, and can be propagated even in vacuum. But uh, for example, that 
that sound that acoustic waves will not travel through vacuum because acoustic waves need air particles uh, to be propagated. Okay, so this is a little bit the story of Otto von Gericke, uh, as that name patron of our university. Okay, and oh, here are nice EMC problems now on the projector. Uh, some, some, some nice interference. And this is Alexander Graham Bell uh, after this unit bell is named. And he not really invented the telephone, but he made it commercially successfully. And he was also um, speech therapist and some engineer. And he found out that our, for example, our hearing, um, our perception of sound pressure also works on a logarithmic scale, like for light intensity and, and pressure itself. Okay, and some numbers to bear in mind, and this is also the idea of the whole logarithmic scale. If we have very large ratios, that these large ratios can be put into tiny numbers. So a ratio of 10 means 10 dB, a ratio of 100 means 20 dB, a ratio of 1000 would be 30 dB, and so on and so on. And vice versa, if you have very, very small ratios, much smaller than one, then it would turn into negative decibel values. But the idea is that all ratios, even very, very large ones and very, very small ones that you will ever have in electrical engineering, that they would all fit into the range of, let's say, minus 200 to plus 200 dB. And then it's very nice and easy and handy to deal, to handle with these numbers, uh, especially because multiplication and division turn out to be plus and minus on this dB scale. Okay, so then the next thing that you can do with decibels is you can have levels. So there the idea is now we want to express um, just one power. And once again, you cannot calculate the logarithm of a power because you cannot calculate the logarithm out of a unit. So you need to have a reference power. So we take a power divided by this reference power, do the same, take the decadic logarithm, multiply by 10, and then we get a power level. Um, and then if we take, for powers, you would usually take one milliwatt as a reference power, and then we would say we would get a power level in dB milliwatt or, or short dBm. And you can practically, once again, do the same for voltages, and then it's a factor of 20 once again. Uh, for these for these voltage levels. Okay, so do not confuse this level with such a level. This is the water level of the Elbe River in Magdeburg. Um, another nice picture of our city center. And so last slide related to this decibel stuff is a short summary of calculation rules. So if you have the sum or difference of two figures, so 20 dB plus 30 dB, if you have an amplifier that amplifies the signal by 20 dB and you feed this into another amplifier which amplifies it by 30 dB, uh, what, what will you get at the end? 50 dB. Uh, so a figure plus a figure is once again a figure. So then if you have the sum of a figure and a level, for example, you take a power level of 0 dBm, feed it into an amplifier of 50 dB, what will you get? Now we will get, we will get 50 dBm at the output. Uh, so um, a level plus a figure is a level. And this is, for, for, for usual units, this would be kind of strange, yeah, you cannot um, calculate the sum of different units, it would not make sense, for example, to say um, one, one meter 80 plus 70 kilogram does not make sense. You cannot add a length and a mass. Uh, and so um, it does not make sense to add different units, but for dB it works because dB is not a real unit, it's a pseudo unit. It's, it's still something unitless. And that's why a level plus a figure gives a level. The opposite is if you have, for example, 50 dBm at the output of an amplifier, 0 dBm at the input, 50 dBm minus 0 dBm 
the difference of two levels gives you a figure. 50 dBm, the amplification of the amplifier. And what usually not works is this, if you have 20 dBm plus 30 dBm fed into a power combiner, this would not give you 50 dBm. So if you do such calculation, it would be usually wrong. You would, you would need to go back, calculate how many milliwatts or watts are this, how many watts or milliwatts are this, then add them up and then go back to the dB scale. Okay. So with this, we can take a look uh, at radiated EMC measurements. And so if you are some manufacturer of a device, um, of some equipment, of some product, you need to make sure that it's electromagnetic compatible. So you could do measurements, you could do simulations, um, but, uh, or calculations and simulations, but what most people do is measurements. And then if you fulfill certain requirements, you would put such a CE mark for uh, conformité European, I hope I pronounce this correctly, on, on the device um, with a certain distance between the C and the E, otherwise it's a different sign. Um, and if you check devices, for example here the remote control of the projector, uh, they usually have this CE mark um, on this because you need this if you if you, if you want to sell your product in the European Union. So then the simplest idea to do EMC measurements would be you go onto some open area test site, um, place your device somewhere, put an antenna somewhere, measure the emission of your device, or you create some field with the antenna and radiate it onto the device. And such a setup, um, worked nicely, let's say 60, 70 years ago, but today you would, you, you would not only measure the emission of the device, you would measure lots of radio stations and cell phones and Wi-Fi networks and so on from the surrounding. And you can also not arbitrarily radiate onto some device because you would not only potentially disturb this device, but lots of devices in the surrounding. And of course, this setup is not nice if it's rainy or foggy or uh, snowy or cold outside. So we would like to somehow shield ourselves for EMC measurements from the surrounding, from the environment. So the question is, how can you shield yourself from, or how, how can you shield electromagnetic waves? Do you have an idea how to block, how to shield electromagnetic waves? Camera. Okay. No, no, no matter because I need it anyhow here. So for this, I've once again created a small experiment, and I will shortly stop sharing my screen for a moment to make this a little larger. So what I have here are two antennas, two printed circuit board antennas. They are once again not very expensive. I think they are 15 euros or 20 euros each, something like this. And so both of these antennas are connected to this device here. And this is a network analyzer. And um, I will shortly go back to my slides to explain what this vector network analyzer does. So this measure so-called scattering parameters. So we have a two-port system like these two antennas. We have an input and an output port and we can excite signals or we can um, transmit waves onto these ports, onto these antennas. So uh, an incoming wave and a reflected wave and an incoming and reflected wave at both ports and then measure the scattering between these ports inside such a scattering matrix. And what we will now analyze is the scattering parameter S21, which is the ratio between 
Um, we are sending some signal here. So we, this is port one. We will send some signal to this antenna and then we will check what is received by the other antenna. That's the idea of the measurement. And um, I will shortly stop sharing the screen. And now I have too few USB ports on my computer. So I need to unplug the software defined radio and plug in this pocket VNA. Okay, and so now as said, it will excite the wave here. Uh, this antenna will create a field, will radiate it onto this antenna, um, and we will once again measure it here. And I know. Um, I now need to find the proper software on my computer, which is here. So I will once again share my screen. There's the software. Okay, so we can now measure from four megahertz, for example, to four gigahertz. I need to load some calibration here um, for the device. And we want to measure a set this S21. I will say that it will continuously scan and already start the measurement. And then we want to look at the magnitude of this and we don't need the phase. Okay, so then we get the coupling between these two antennas. And the measurement takes, I don't know, 10 seconds or so. And once the measurement is finished, then the device starts to take a new measurement and plots these two curves nicely on top of each other. So we can see, okay, there's, there's quite a good re repeatability um, in, in these measurement results. And now the question is, what could I put in between these antennas to block the electromagnetic waves? And I mean, what, what we could try, for example, is some paper. So this is the, uh, the, the who is who brochure of uh, the International Week at the University of Angers, made out of paper. If I put this in between the antennas, no, 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 nothing will happen. Um, okay, if I put my hand between these antennas, then you can see, okay, there's some deviation. There's something will happen. So my, my, my hand is at least somehow dissipating electromagnetic waves. Other ideas? Metal. Luckily, we are in a physics lab. So I found some aluminum plate. If I put this aluminum plate in between there, then we can see that the aluminum plate um, also nicely attenuates the waves. There is of course an issue that some wave will go on top and will go below and there will be coupling from the antenna to this cable and to the other cable and back to this antenna. But um, this aluminum plate works quite well. What, what, what I have brought from Magdeburg to demonstrate this is um, such metallized textiles. So this looks like fabric, but there are metal fibers in there. So if we take this and if I take this, this is a little larger, then uh, you can see that this really nicely, it's not really working at low frequencies, but because there are the antennas are not working, but this, that this nicely blocks the electromagnetic waves. And so you can have a look at this. And this is a different sample, uh, a little different fabric uh, which also works very nice in blocking these electromagnetic waves, as, as we can see. And I will also give this to you. What, what you can try, what the students tried yesterday, is if you, if you take your cell phone and wrap your cell phone in this, and then try to call the cell phone, it, it won't work anymore. <laughs> yeah. If, if, no, if the, if you wrap the cell phone in this, in this conductive fabric into this shielding textile 
And then if you try to call the cell phone, cell phone won't. It's like a Faraday cage, exactly. Okay, so let's go back to my slides. <laughs> okay, so obviously metal shields the electromagnetic waves, so we could build a laboratory with metal all around, like a Faraday cage. And the metal works for the electromagnetic waves like a mirror. So all the waves that come from the outside, that would be mirrored back, which is nice. But all the waves that we create on the inside, they would be also mirrored back. So imagine you are in a room where there are mirrors all around and you turn on a flashlight. What will happen? There will be light from everywhere yeah? and you don't know where the light is coming from and where the light is going and you just see lots of reflections from the single ray of light. And the same would happen in such a shielded room. So the usual idea for EMC measurements is that you put lots of these absorbers in such a room. So they work like black paint for light and they would absorb the electromagnetic wave so that we just measure the direct path between one antenna and the device on a test. Um, but this setup is also associated with some disadvantages because if you want to do immunity testing with high field strengths, you need very, very powerful and very, very um, expensive amplifiers to create strong electromagnetic waves and then these high electromagnetic fields, they will hit your device and test once and then they will go into the absorbers and then they will just turn into very um, expensive heat. So the idea is to don't use absorbers um, and to use so-called reverberation chambers. And this is what we also have in Magdeburg. This is kind of a famous picture because if you search the English Wikipedia for electromagnetic reverberation chamber, you will find this picture. Um, the motorcycle was not actually tested. It was just placed in there to make the picture look nice. It's a motorcycle of some former colleague of mine. And it's also a shielded room. So we excite their waves with some antenna. Um, and then the waves will run through the space and will be reflected and reflected and so on. So what you get is standing waves. And standing waves means there are points in space where the field strength is very high. And there are points in space where the field strength is very small. So you would need to take your device on a test and move it around to find a position where you now have a high field strength to, to do immunity testing. And this is obviously what you do not want to do. So um, what, what we are trying there is a little bit in the saying, if the prophet cannot go to the mountain, the mountain needs to go to the prophet. We, we leave the device on a test in, at the position and we move the field around. And moving the field around works with this device here. Uh, there are metal plates connected to this and they will change the reflection of the waves and move this field pattern around in space. And this, this Field patterns are called modes, and this is what we use to change these modes. So this is what we call a mode stirrer, and the whole thing is called a mode stirrer chamber. But at the end, it's not so different than uh, what you have as your microwave oven at home. So there's a nice and a little funny theorem from um, American scientist Carl Baum, who said, what is the difference between a reverberation chamber and a microwave oven? Yeah, in a microwave oven at home, you cook chicken, and in our reverberation chamber, we cook electronic chicken. We, we test electronic equipment for high field strengths. Still, because the, the uh, comparison quite, is quite interesting, we should take a look 
at um, such usual microwave ovens. Has everyone such a microwave oven at home? Yes, for sure. They are, they are not super old. So they are there since the 1950s. This is one of the first commercial uh, things that you could buy from the company Raytheon that still exists, but they still do what they have also done at this time. They build radar systems for civilian and military application. And this is the inventor of the microwave oven, Percy Spencer. And the legend says that he stood uh, in his laboratory and he had the magnetron, which is the main component of such a radar system to create the electromagnetic waves. Um, laying on his laboratory table and it was creating electromagnetic waves and then he stood there and uh, after some time he felt a nice warm sensation in the uh, pockets of his trouser and what happened is that there he had the chocolate bar in there and the chocolate bar melted. So he got the idea okay maybe this can be used to to somehow heat up food. So uh, he tried, for example, corn, and this is also what we all know what happens then. Yeah, so the water inside there starts to cook, and um, there is evaporation, and the, the hull cannot hold the pressure anymore, and this turns into popcorn. And so what you can also do at home, if you like, you can do a so-called experiment. Uh, you take an uncooked chicken egg, and put it in the microwave oven for a half minute or minute or so and then there's a so-called explosion yeah, and then if you look like this so do, only only do this if you like to clean a lot because it will be it will be a mess so we can have a short look on the field inside such a reverberation chamber or in such inside such a microwave oven so these are approximately dimensions, 30 by 30 centimeters. So there are points in space where the field strength is very, very high and where the food will burn and there are other places where the food will stay cold. And so what you then do in your microwave, what you have in your microwave oven is you have this turntable that moves the food around in the field so that it will get evenly hot. Uh, what people do that don't know how this microwave oven works is they just put the food in the center so that the food will rotate, but it will still stay at the same position. So first take home message or one take home message for you, put the food on the outside of this turntable so that it nicely moves around in this field and evenly gets hot. So then usually question is also, is it a good idea to put metal in a microwave oven? No, yeah, because we've seen it will shield the waves, food will not get hot. So this is not a good idea. Uh, what is with a spoon? Spoon, spoon will work, the tea will get hot, there will be currents induced on the spoon, the spoon will also get hot, but everything is fine. Um, so this will work. On the other hand, if you have a fork, for example, yeah, the fork has edges and tips, and there will be high field strength at the tips and spark overs. So in general, at the saying, don't put metal in the microwave, um, it's, it's true. Yeah? So because if you use this such, if you would put a compact disc or a plate with the uh, with this gold paintings on it, um, the metallic layer is just too thin to carry the current. So don't don't in general don't put metal in the microwave. Okay, and so then there is a small experiment that you can also do at home. You take a chocolate bar, uh, you remove the aluminum foil because this would also, of course, shield the electromagnetic fields, and you put this chocolate bar inside the microwave so that it will not rotate, or you would somehow have to disable this, this turntable. And then what will happen is that, as said, the chocolate will melt and burn at some places, like here and here and here, and in between it will stay cold. And so now we can say, okay, there must have been a high field strength here and a high field strength here and a high field strength here. So we can measure with the ruler the distance between two maxima of this wave and you will get something like 12 centimeters, which is the wavelength inside the microwave oven. 
Yeah, in short, it should not rotate. It should stay fixed in place. Yeah? And, and then it will happen like this. So we now know the wavelengths. Then you also need to have the frequency. And the frequency of the microwave oven is 2.4 uh, gigahertz. And with these two values, you can calculate the velocity of light. Put this into the, this equation. Uh, wavelengths multiplied with frequency and then with household equipment you can measure the velocity of light and end up with the approximately uh, 300,000 kilometers per second. Okay, and more or less the same is what will happen in the reverberation chamber. And so we still have time for some short quiz. And I need to find it here and click on start there will be five questions and we will take the classic mode and there will be the game pin and we also need to have some music so there's the music Okay, and I'm I'm checking where the music is. <laughs> ah, okay. And there we have the music. So everyone connected, should I show the QR code once again? Okay, wait, wait. So we have 15 people. And I will click start. So we have a quiz for the short course on EMC measurements and reverberation chambers that will start in three, two, one with five questions. And this is the first question. What is no coupling path? No, no coupling path in terms of electromagnetic compatibility. Okay, interesting. The question is, what was no, what is no coupling pass? So, and acoustics is, has nothing to do with electromagnetics. So th this, this is the right answer. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. For... So there are just two people on the board and Jana Lodbrok and Mati. Okay. So let's come to the next question. At which frequencies do typical 4G cell phones operate? Is it at around 0 0.5 to 5 megahertz? Is it around 5 to 50 at 50 to 500 megahertz? Or at around 500 to megahertz to 5 gigahertz? 
Okay, and here most people have chosen the correct answer. And where's my mouse button that is? So let's have a look at the leaderboard. Uh, Jana, I don't know how to pronounce this, uh, but he's quite good. And Mati still on the second place. So let's come to the third question. The decibel scale is a logarithmic scale based on the human sensory perception, except for which one? So there are three that work on a logarithmic scale, but one that doesn't, and which one is it? So, as said, uh, loudness, acoustic pressure, this works on a logarithmic scale. Our hearing, this is why it's named after Alexander Graham Bell. Also, our usual sensation of pressure works on a logarithmic scale. Also, our uh, for, for, for brightness. And why? Because we can hear very, very small signals and we can also are able to hear very, very loud signals before our ears will be destroyed. And the reason why our um, sensors for temperature more work on a linear scale is because the temperature range where we are comfortable as humans is quite limited. If it's below zero degrees Celsius, let's say, then it's very, very cold and potentially dangerous. And if it's above, let's say, 40 degrees Celsius, it's very, very hot and also potentially dangerous. So this range here is very, very limited and therefore uh, we don't need to have this logarithmic impression of it. Okay, so <laughs> chance for le, le buteux or so to, 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 to climb up a little bit here on the ladder. So sec, second to last question is which factor is in front of the logarithm when calculating a gain or a level in decibels? Is it always 10? Is it always 20? Is it 20 for power levels and 10 for voltage levels or root power values? Okay, excellent. This, this, was, this was the question that everyone yesterday answered wrong. Okay, so... Ooh. Mati climbing up onto the first place and we come to the last question where this this meant more more than one answer is correct um, how can the field pattern or cavity modes be changed inside such a reverberation chamber is it by rotating a mode stirrer or a pedal is it can it be done by bending or shaking flexible walls uh, can it be done by moving the transmitting antenna or by changing the frequency of the excitation. Oh, and in this question, all answers have been correct, so you could just you could, could not do anything wrong, just be faster or not that fast. So we will see that Regie is on the third place. Okay, so congratulations to everyone. Um, and I have I have also some prizes. I have some cookies. So wh whoever, wh who is, okay, so. Ah, okay, then you have. <laughs> yeah, this. The second is, uh, so I, I, will, I will put it here. I don't have to, I don't want to walk all the way. Okay. 
that was it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, I hope you learned something, at least some basics about electromagnetic waves and shielding and how to measure stuff. So with this, uh, I wish you the best of success for your further studies here in Angers. If you finish your bachelor and if you ever want to do a master in electrical engineering, feel free to come to Magdeburg. We have nice English bachelor uh, and, and master courses on electrical engineering, information technology, uh, also medical systems engineering, renewable energies and stuff. And yeah, happy to meet you there. Okay, and with this. I will click. Stop streaming. Bye bye. Au revoir.